Hi, everyone. Uh, I thought I would give a quick introduction to our unit on repetition in music. Repetition is a very important issue in the study of music. Um, arguably, it's one of the central conceits of how music works. If you think about any familiar song, you have a sort of repeating verse, chorus, verse, chorus structure. Um, music is based on repeating elements that are familiar to us, uh, letting us become familiar through various times of hearing something, and uh, a lot of musical expectation, musical emotion is brought on by either repetition or the anticipation of repetition. You know, if you think about that verse-chorus structure, you hear the verse, you hear the first chorus, the second verse comes, and you know as the energy starts to build at the end of the second verse, you know the chorus is going to come back, and it's usually going to be this big soaring feeling. Usually the, the musical high point of the song is the chorus, um, and you can kind of anticipate that coming, and that's one of the major features of repetition. There are other features of repetition, of course, uh, but I'm going to leave those for our main reading for this unit. Um, the main reading for this unit is the first chapter of a book called On Repeat, subtitled uh, How Music Plays the Mind. It's by an author named Elizabeth Helmuth Margulis. Uh, she's a professor at the University of Arkansas. Um, where she runs a whole music cognition lab. Music cognition is the study of uh, the cognitive psychology of music. So On Repeat is her major book from about five years ago now. Um, and this first chapter especially really synthesizes and gives a good sample of the different kinds of methodologies that music theorists use to study music. Um, Margolis is going to talk about history. She's going to talk about linguistics. She's going to talk about emotion. She's going to talk about uh, psychology. They actually are doing, you know, experiments with subjects, tracking their statistical responses to things. Um, she's interested in the way that music has been talked about, the way that we understand language and how that may or may not transfer. She's interested in the way that we understand rep uh, emotion, anticipation, and she's doing actual experiments to kind of measure these things. And this chapter is a really good synthesis of all of these different methodologies to apply them to the study of music. And one of the reasons why I have this very musically focused chapter uh, in the course is that repetition is an extremely important element of video games as well. Um, almost any game that you can think of, you're doing repetitive actions, whether it's Tetris, whether it's Candy Crush, um, whether it's Fortnite, where you basically have the same game mode over and over again. Um, you can think of any sport, any sport... Um, is similar each time. The rules prescribe the way that the game is going to go, and gaining expertise uh, in a game or a sport requires a lot of focused repetition, which we call practice, um, attempting to get better and better and better. So this is a really important element of video games. It's been somewhat studied, um, for example, by people like Jasper Jewell, Jesper Jewell is uh, a game academic, and he's got a book called The Art of Failure uh, that is all about the way that we fail, we lose, we die, etc. in video games, but we start them back over again. And Jewell kind of analyzes uh, the psychology of this and how this contributes to the pleasure of mastery, the pleasure of trying something over and over again until you actually get it. So repetition has been looked at in terms of uh, game play and game design, but there's a lot less out there about actual musical repetition in soundtracks. You know, obviously it's ubiquitous. We hear the Tetra song over and over and over again, the Mario song over and over and over again. Um, most video game soundtracks are built on repetition. 
um, and in some way they have to be designed that way. But there's not a whole lot of theorization about how that might go together with gameplay and how both of these elements of repetition might go together with what we know about repetition in other music. So to get you ready for this Margolis chapter, uh, I thought I would go over just a little bit about um, a couple of the elements you might want to keep in mind. The chapter is fairly self-explanatory, but I want to sketch out um, a little bit of the background knowledge. Um, you know, some of the background that I would give you if this were a regular on-campus class. I'd probably give a short lecture that went something like this uh, and focused a little bit on the history of the music to language metaphor. So this is a very common trope throughout the history of music. You've probably heard the statement, music is a universal language. Which, you know, implicit in this is that uh, Music being a universal language is something that people think can sort of transcend culture and bring people together. It's a very common statement, um, but there's a, a lot to unpack there. Because number one, this sort of overrides all of the different cultural, uh, the cultural differences that go along with music. Uh, the music of different cultures is very different in certain aesthetic ways, in its aesthetic priorities, in the ways that things are constructed from formal and repetition schemes to the kinds of harmonies, to the kinds of melodies, the scales, the ways that they're understood, the way that music functions in different cultures. So there's a lot of arguments against it actually being universal. Um, but what I'm interested in today is the ways that it is and is not a language. And uh, a lot of people have made different kinds of arguments about the ways in which music may or may not be related to language. So one of these uh, ways in which the common association is made is uh, linguistic models of music. There are a lot of people who have tried to study um, the ways in which musical phrases go together. So if you think about the linguistics of language, if you think, for example, how uh, in elementary school you probably learned to diagram sentences or to sort of break them down um, into different sections. You know, you might have the subject, which would be a noun, the verb, the object on which it's acting. Um, in English, we don't talk about cases very much, but if you've studied almost any foreign language, you've learned to think about cases, the nominative case, um, the accusative case, or the dative case, depending on the kind of object that something might be. And a lot of linguistic analysis has broken these things down into structures, you know, on which there are various kind of branching diagrams that show how one object is subservient to another or one object is necessary or it acts on another. Um, and a lot of these are uh, also carried over into music. If you think about musical chords, we talk about like a one chord or a five chord. Um, there are a lot of people who have carried this through and thought about, oh, this is the way that these things are sort of dependent on each other, um, that there's a movement from here to here, and this is the important moment, and this is how these objects relate. So there are sort of models of music that go directly off of linguistics. There are also, under sort of part two of linguistic models, there are people who think about um, rhythm, meter, and what we call prosody, the rhythm of speech, um, the ways in which we inflect sentences, the ways in which I speak in a certain kind of a rhythmic cadence. Um, depending on the language, you might have pitch involved in this as well. Um, but a lot of people have looked to music and language 
for example, um, song settings, the way that people in different languages set their text to music says something about their language, and maybe it says something about the way that they conceive of music. Um, there are all these studies of sort of what people will call nationalistic rhythms, the way that French is set to music, the way that German is set to music. So there are a lot of very close metaphors that use linguistics either as a disciplinary model, this is how we analyze music, or that try to draw together, this is how music and language influence each other. There are also um, a lot of people who have studied bird song or whale song, um, kind of looking for um, natural models. You know, looking for the ways that animals construct their songs as, as a sort of a substitute for what people think early human music making might have been. Um, there are a lot of theories about the ways in which human language and music making co-evolved. Um, you'll find, for example, a scholar named Stephen Mithin, who wrote a book called The Singing Neanderthals. Mithin is very interested in the ways in which um, human language might have evolved alongside music making or the ways in which song and singing might have influenced the models of uh, language. And then sort of on the other side, you have somebody like Steven Pinker, um, who's this sort of evolutionary psychologist. Um, and in a couple of his different books, I think it was he originally made the argument either in How the Mind Works or The Blank Slate, which are two of his big books from the 1990s. Um, this famous quote is uh, also repeated in the Margolis chapter, in which he says, music is auditory cheesecake. Um, and what he means by this is, uh, Pinker thinks that music is unnecessary. You know, somebody like Mithin or a lot of other evolutionary uh, psychologists and archaeologists and anthropologists would say music co-evolved with language or music has played important roles in society. It brings community together. Um, it's if you use this sort of animal model, it might be a way in which males try to attract a mate. Um, but Pinker says, no, 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 no. Music is just extra. Language evolved. Society is centered on that. Um, human civilization is centered on language. And music is this nice extra thing that we got. Yes, maybe some of the same competencies are involved, but music is just kind of extra. Um, and so in a lot of ways, Pinker saying this in the 90s, you know, launched a thousand academic studies of music. You know, he really kind of got under the skin of musicologists and theorists. And a lot of people have been trying to refute the things that Pinker said by showing just how important music can be um, in human civilization and just how closely it's connected with language. Margolis, on the other hand, is going to argue that repetition is a very important way in which music does not equal language. Music is different than language. And I'll leave it to you to read that chapter and kind of get the different pieces of evidence um, that she cites. There are two or three very specific arguments um, that kind of come out of the different methods, you know, the experimental methods, the linguistic methods, the historical theoretical methods that she uses. There are a few arguments she makes for why music is not like language when it comes to repetition. So that's sort of the major contribution of this chapter. Uh, one or two other things to keep in mind. You know, pay attention to the types of arguments that she makes. Pay attention to... Um, the ways that she talks about sort of how we consume um, or how we uh, perceive or interact with 
music versus language. Or I'll say even music versus text. This is a very important point of the chapter. Um, and you might even think about how do games fit into this distinction? And finally, uh, one important thing to notice when she uses it is this sort of notion of competence. This is a very core principle of linguistics, and it's something that musicologists always kind of stumble over or always have to account for. Um, we think of competence in linguistic terms as, you know, being able to understand a language, being able to make statements in a language. And linguistically, this is a pretty low bar. All of us from a very young age are fully competent in our na native languages, but uh, we don't necessarily rise to the level of, uh, you know, a Pulitzer Prize winning poet. Um, for example, we don't become these sort of world-renowned experts of language, even though we have deep, thorough competence in language. And so think about the things that Margolis says about musical competence and what the significance of this might be. You know, the bar for musical competence may or may not be higher, depending on uh, where you'd like to set it, because I would say that a lot of us are competent listeners, um, but the competence to produce new musical utterances is a little bit less common or requires a little bit more training. So pay attention to um, what Margolis is going to say about musical competence and what the significance of that is for her argument. Finally, I'd like to uh, drop in another video because Margolis has this really great uh, famous example by a psychiatrist named Diana Deutsch. Diana Deutsch is a, a well-known music psychologist. She's taught at the University of California in San Diego for a long time. Um, Margolis uh, cites this sort of text-to-song illusion that Deutsch discovers unintentionally. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and close this video by playing a Radio Lab segment, actually, where they're going to interview Deutsch and uh, kind of play a little bit of the example. It's a really uncanny, so go ahead and listen to this final example before you read, and then uh, it'll come up in the Margolis reading. So here's Diana Deutsch on Radio Lab talking about her text to speech or text to song illusion. This is Professor Diana Deutsch. Diana Deutsch. Well, yeah, I'm going to turn down my headphone level. In fact. And I'm a professor of psychology at the University of California, San Diego. Can you still hear me, Diana? Okay. Hello? Diana studies sound, how humans perceive sound. She's a scientist, she has a lab, but every so often she will also release CDs. Right. These uh, CDs of audio demonstrations that she uses in her research, and that's why we called, because it was in the production of her second CD that she stumbled onto the weirdest phenomenon. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what happened, is that um, when you do post-production, as, as you know, of, of, of speech, you loop things, loop things, loop things, so that you can zero in on P's, put, put that sound too loud, you need to unpop, or S's that sound too sharp, and so on. So you put things on loops in order to fine-tune the way the speech sounds. So I had this particular phrase on a loop and forgot about it. What phrase was this? It's a phrase that occurs at the beginning of the CD in which I say, the sounds as they appear to you are not, not only, only different, different from those, those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely as to seem quite impossible. Seem quite impossible. Now, I had sometimes behave so strangely looped. The sounds as they appear to you are not only different from those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely. Sometimes behave so strangely. Just those few words. Sometimes behave so strangely. And forgot about sometimes it. Sometimes behave so strangely. Sometimes behave so strangely. So here's what happened. Diana sometimes leaves her studio. She so closes strangely. the door, goes into the kitchen to make sometimes some tea. All the while, so this loop is whirring away in the sometimes background. As she's so sipping strangely. her tea, she thinks, 
Is someone singing? Who's singing? I heard what sounded like song in the background. She realized. Wait a second. That's not singing. That's me. Talking. That very phrase. Strangely. But at this point, sometimes behave so strangely. Appear to be sung rather than spoken. So strangely. Sometimes behave so strangely. This is sometimes behave so strangely, right? <laughs> yeah, you still hear the words, but the, they're sung words rather than spoken words. It's weird. Like it just switches at a certain point, three or four repetitions in. Right. It's going, it's going, and then pow, it becomes music. And then now, now none of us can get it out of our head. Like the whole office is like sometimes behave so strangely. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes behave, behave so, so strangely. strangely. And you know what? If you do this demo and then. You go back to the original sentence. It sounds like, you know, speech to begin with. And when you come to that very phrase, I seem to be bursting into song. The sounds as they appear to you are not only different from those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely as to seem quite impossible. I have to say, this can continue for months and months. It's sort of, <laughs> sort of like your brain gets altered for that particular phrase, and and it, and it continues to sound like singing for a very, very long time.